Okay. Again, I'm recording uh, just for convenience. Hopefully everyone, uh, it seems to be the case that everyone's able to make these class sessions uh, live uh, as intended. So uh, we can have some interactions. Um, again, feel free to uh, to raise your hand or uh, uh, post in a in the chat or um, yeah, go ahead and open your microphone. I think you should have permissions to be able to do that um and uh and shot at me i don't uh you know while i'm doing my presentations i don't actually see my uh, uh screen I, I do have dual monitors but i'm i'm not uh it's not easy to see the um the, the google meet screen so uh you might have to scream loud at me to get my attention um yeah one of the things to think about with these uh you know gps uh jamming and uh, spoofing and that type of thing is that most of your uh, planes that you ride on are now uh, piloted by a large degree by GPS, right? So, um, and the uh, approaches, the um, you know, landings that a pilot is, is taking is going to be um, uh, guided by GPS. Uh, there's, you know, of course, older technology and uh, in most cases that still works, but uh, GPS these days is your main way of doing that. Um, uh, so what happens if someone decides to suddenly start spoofing, right? So jamming is one thing um, and that's uh, maybe easier to deal with if your system is no longer giving you a, um, an act, uh, a fix output then you can simply uh, you know switch over and uh, use other means of uh, navigate navigating excuse me but if it's spoofed um, you need to figure that out right so uh, that's a danger and uh, if it's spoofed and you don't realize it's spoofed then um, yeah, uh, significant things happen. But again, no no easy answer. Uh, the military likes to, you know, keep certain things to themselves because, yeah, uh, hopefully we can, um, you know, we don't always do a very good job of vetting people in the military. We're always, you know, reading uh, articles about uh, some new spy or, or something like that, right? Um, but uh, at least you're not having to vet 300 million people. Um, so yeah, how do you how do you control that technology so it's not used against you? A little bit of history and uh, GPS uh, back uh, in the early days, up through uh, somewhere in the 90s, um, uh, the civilian signals were. Uh, purposely distorted um, in a process called selective availability. And in fact, uh, uh, what it would do is dither the signal a little bit so that um, you could not get a really accurate fix uh, and stuff. So um, uh, that, that got turned off during the Clinton administration and uh, uh, kind of enable GPS to really take off and uh, be ubiquitous in our uh, society and our uh, important factor in our economy. So, um, yeah, just kind of a little bit of history lesson there. All right, so let me uh, share again. Okay, so um, GNSS, yeah, you probably caught me uh, saying, uh, rallying off that acronym earlier, uh, stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. Um, so, you know, I try to correct myself if I say GNSS system because that's a little bit redundant, right? So what are the big examples of these? Uh, so they'd be our GPS, uh, our being the U.S. Global Positioning System, Galileo is a European Union system, GLONASS is uh, a Russian system, uh, Beidou, uh, I think is how I've heard it pronounced, uh, is 
uh, Chinese system. Uh, Ernest is uh, Indian and QZSS is Japanese. Uh, the latter two are, are more uh, not, not quite global systems, they're more regionally focused. Um, but yeah, um, uh, GPS is not the only one. And, um, but uh, they're all follow many of the same uh, principles, right? So uh, of operation. Uh, GNSS systems provide uh, precise time signals from precisely known locations. And I'm using precise there. Accuracy is also very important, but it's, um, but it's, you know, definitely needs to emphasize precise, right? Uh, the global positioning system in particular has 24 satellites uh, in medium earth orbit. So um, if you may be, familiar with geosynchronous satellites, and those are way the heck out there. Uh, but they're all spaced around the equator, and they're at an orbital height or altitude such that they rotate around the Earth at the same rate that the Earth rotates. And uh, so they're uh, synchronous, they're geosynchronous in that they appear in the same spot over the Earth uh, always, right? Whereas um, at the other extreme, we have low Earth orbits, uh, which is maybe a couple of hundred uh, miles uh, up, and um, that's where the ISS space station uh, and other space stations exist, orbit. Uh, that's where uh, Starlink operates and uh, where uh, Project Kuiper from Amazon and OneWeb and uh, similar type of uh, imaging, uh, commercial imaging uh, uh, satellites operate and that type of thing, right? So um, in between, as you might expect, is a medium Earth orbit. So um, uh, the... They uh, provide what's called PNT, position, navigation, and, and timing operations. Uh, each satellite has uh, an atomic clock, or really several atomic clocks, and it really depends on which generation uh, we continue to improve and evolve the satellites that make up the space segment of the GPS uh, system. And so they have improved uh, atomic clocks, but all of them have more than one atomic clock on them, and they are periodically synchronized to uh, <clears throat> NTS atomic clocks in Boulder, Colorado by the Air Force. Well, really, the Navy does a lot of work in between here, uh, actually, and then the Air Force basically sends the commands up to the satellite to, to synchronize uh, the clocks. But uh, Historically, and by that I mean over hundreds of years, navies have been very interested in time and position because they're navigating uh, on uh, you know blue ocean uh, and uh, uh, very far away, and so uh, timekeeping and navigation is very important to them. And so uh, the navies are always played a central role in that. Um, uh, so the uh, GPS system is broken up into three different segments. There's the space segment, and that's the one that we uh, often think about. Uh, those are the 24 satellites up there with those atomic clocks and their uh, uh, transmitters that send the uh, signals down to Earth, their antennas, their power supplies, uh, solar cells, batteries, thrusters to keep them in the proper orbits and that type of thing, right? Uh, but all that is our 24 plus satellites, right? So 24 is kind of the minimum or it's actually more than that, plus a few spares and uh, some newer satellites that aren't necessarily online yet and that type of thing, right? So uh, then there's a control segment. So it'd be like run by the Air Force, the Space Force, um, and uh, that is um, uh, also includes the 
uh, networks and of radars that track the positions of these satellites and uh, update the positions and orbital parameters to the Air Force so that they can uh, correct things and that type of thing. And then there's the user segment. And so that's uh, what maybe we uh, touch and feel every day as soon as we pick up our smartphone or uh, other type of uh, system that has a GPS in it, we're participating in that user segment. Okay. Uh, so yeah, there's a minimum of 24 satellites in a GPS constellation, uh, typically 27 plus spares. Um, that medium Earth orbit is actually at 20,200 kilometers, and that is at a 55 degree inclination. Um, in six equally spaced orbital planes. So when we talk about inclination, uh, that is how, if you look at that orbit, uh, how is it spaced with respect to the equator, right? Are we uh, wrapped around the equator? No, actually we're, we're at a, a fairly steep uh, angle to that. So um, uh, uh, we, uh, can cover much more of the Earth from this medium Earth orbit, but not all at the same time, right? So um, there's six equally spaced orbital planes, and I've got to figure in the next slide that might explain this a little bit more. Uh, and then in each of those planes, uh, we have these uh, four satellites spaced out in them. Uh, roughly spaced out, okay, um, and because uh, we do have these uh, actually three extra and some spares that are uh, in some of those slots too. So each satellite orbits the Earth twice per what we call a side reel day. Now, if you've played with your uh, a telescope some or, or not any orbital dynamics, uh, you might uh, see that, but uh, that's actually slightly less than 24 hours uh, of a day, and uh, it's just because of how, as the Earth rotates around the sun, um, a particular uh, spot uh, over the Earth uh, kind of uh, changes slightly. So instead of a 24-hour day, it's a 23-hour and many uh, minutes type of thing. So um, it basically keeps the satellites in the same positions over the Earth as it uh, as a uh, orbit, right? So they'll they'll stay in that same orbital plane. The goal of the system, uh, this constellation design, is that for any uh, receiver on Earth, uh, it's can easily see four satellites. Um, typically, if you have a clear horizon, yeah, if you're out on the ocean. You're going to have a clear horizon. Um, you can see uh, nine. If you're uh, in uh, the middle of uh, uh, on the street level in midtown or downtown, and you've got buildings, tall buildings all around you uh, that are blocking your view of the sky, uh, you might struggle to see four. Okay? But um, uh, so uh, here's a little bit of a description of. Uh, the orbital plane, you see that um, maybe the altitude's higher than you might expect. Uh, you know, it's it's not just skimming the Earth like low Earth orbits are. Um, um, but uh, each of these satellites you see here, there's an orbital plane. And uh, this is inclined uh, 55 degrees. And so it's going to be uh, seeing a swath over the Earth. Or if, if you're on the Earth, you're going to see that satellite uh, uh, rise and then uh, set uh, at an angle uh, as, as it uh, orbits around, right? So uh, here's an uh, example from Lockheed Martin's latest uh, uh, version uh, three, uh, block three uh, satellite system. A GPS satellite just gives you an example of it. Here's a uh, uh, not very candid uh, picture of a couple of uh, uh, soldiers uh, 
manning the, the ground station, right? So they've got you know, a couple of computers there that uh, they're uh, in uh, responsible for that control segment, right? So monitoring those orbits and, and whatnot. All right, let's see. Um, so where are we, right? Um, suppose we know the location of some observables. Right? So something that we can see, observe, sense, something like that, right? How can we use them to find out where we are? So I'll use an example of marine charts. Uh, I like to boat. I used to live on a boat. Uh, hopefully uh, can get a sailboat soon and, and stuff. But um, uh, marine charts are marked with the location of things that you can see. Right, lighthouses, buoys, uh, TV, radio towers, that type of thing, right? They're marked on your chart. Um, <clears throat> you can get a really good idea of where you're at uh, by taking your compass and sighting or taking bearings to uh, two or more of these objects, right? So I can uh, uh, maybe look off towards starboard and see a lighthouse over there, and I'll line up my compass and I'll see that it's at uh, uh, 27 degrees or something, right? Like that, right? So uh, then I'll go to my chart and I will uh, find that location of the lighthouse marked on a chart and I'll draw a line at that angle, uh, 27 degrees magnetic. Uh, by the way, the magnetic pole is not the same as the North Pole. It's offset uh, some by that. Not gonna be important in this, uh, course a whole lot but uh if you do any navigation um that's something to be concerned about um so then i would probably look in a very different direction maybe 90 degrees uh away and try to see if there's uh maybe a tower and there's a, a tower off my bow uh, maybe a little bit on the port side and i do another angle to that maybe that's um um you know three 40 degrees or or something like that i don't know uh, three 310 degrees and i'll i'll draw a line from that tower on the chart at that angle and where those lines intersect is my location right if i've done a good job of it um you know the boat's bouncing around and you know i can only sight my compass so well and estimate maybe that was 27 and a half degrees or 0.4 degrees i don't know so let me uh, look in a few other different directions and try to uh, draw some more lines, bearing lines. And uh, hopefully, you know, ideally, they all cross at a single point. Practically, they're going to kind of cross in some little region, right? So, uh, and I might kind of pick the center of where all those lines cross. And if I've been good and picked diverse directions, right? So I'm not just picking, uh, you know, something that's uh, off my port side and then another object off my port side and another object off my port side. All those lines are going to be almost parallel, right? So I want lines that are orthogonal or, or very different to each other. If I did one that was directly off my port and directly off my bow, uh, off my, uh, I'm sorry, off my, uh, off my starboard side and off my port side, then they're still gonna be parallel, right? And so I want them to be roughly orthogonal or at least very diverse, right? And uh, then I'm gonna get, um, I'm gonna reduce the errors and I'm gonna pick uh, that point right in the middle. That's gonna be my best estimate, right? We do the same thing with celestial navigation, except now we're using a sextant and we might do a, what's called a noon site we we try to estimate looking at the sun when it's uh, reached its highest point in the sky before it goes down that's your uh noon point and now you look at the angle from um uh that it's that it's sitting at right and uh from that you can determine what latitude you're at right so um uh, uh then and you know, knowing uh, roughly the time of year and that type of thing, if you know the time very precisely, now you can start determining the, the longitude. 
So, um, so we're basically taking some observables that are in known locations, right? And we're making measurements from uh, ourselves, our ego vehicles, so to speak, and uh, using those measurements uh, and these known locations to try to figure out where we're at, okay? And what we just talked about has actually been triangulation, right? Because we're using angles. We're going to use trilateralization or, in general, multilateral, laterate, later, multilateration. Okay, there we go. Um, now, suppose instead of an angle, we know the distance to a known location. All right, so let's say that known location is a transmitter in New York City. And uh, so we uh, somehow measure that radio signal and uh, some timing information on it or something. And uh, we find out that we're, um, oh, you know, 400 miles from New York City, from that central location. But we don't know whether we're there or there or there or there, or anywhere on that circuit, right? So let's uh, let's take another measurement. Now, you know, so I'm near St. Louis. Um, let's have a tower there, and we measure our distance. Again, we haven't said how we're measuring that distance, but we are measuring that distance. And uh, let's say that instead of 400 miles, that's, um, I don't know, 550 miles or whatever, right? And now we plot these circles at a, at a radius that's equivalent to that distance, right? And uh, now we can be reasonably confident that we're at one of these two locations. We still don't know exactly which one, but uh, we know we're somewhere on this circle and we know we're somewhere on this circle. So the intersection of those two lo loci are, um, are at these points right there, okay? So let's then, uh, let's use a tower in Charlotte. And now, okay, finally, we have one solution that meets all of these uh, criteria, right? So we'll, we'll say that really marks our spot, okay? So here, now we know the distance. Now I've, you know, kind of said we're using a radio signal, so you might guess that we're measuring some sort of time and then relating that to distance, but somehow we've measured this these distances and uh, we found a unique point that satisfies those. Okay, so that's multilateralization, multilateration. I need to practice that. All right, but we live in a 3D world. Right, so that previous slide assumed a 2D world. In the 3D world, those circles are really spheres, right? So, um, still satisfying, you know, that that sphere is now this loci uh, of uh, uh, points, locus of points that uh, is all the different uh, areas or, or uh, points that satisfy that distance, right, from the center. In the GNS system, the sphere's origins are in space. Well, they're, they're the satellites, right? And so uh, this actually adds an additional degree of freedom, right? So we, we might speculate that we need a fourth satellite to figure that out, uh, maybe. But if we can assume that we are located on or near the Earth, then we can discard the other point, which is far in space. You may not always make that assumption. You might be trying to uh, 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 determine the location of your, your satellite um, itself, right? Maybe another type of satellite, and you're trying to use GPS uh, to do that. Um, that's not easy because the antennas are actually pointed at Earth, <laughs> but, uh, but just like mathematically, physically speaking, uh, 
that other point that the sphere would um, uh, satisfy is out in space. And so we, we can just assume that we're on or, or near the Earth. So pseudo race ranges. In GNSS, we do not measure distance directly. We measure time difference between when the satellite transmitted the signal and when we receive it. So uh, we're, we're sending a radio signal and um, we're gonna somehow know when we sent it and we're gonna know when we received it. And so we can take those time differences, uh, the difference of those two times and say, that's how long it took that signal to uh, move or travel between the satellite and my receiver. Okay? And now I can translate that to, um, uh, to a position if we know the speed of that wave, well, close to the speed of light, right? So uh, I say close because I'm going to qualify that. Uh, so we need to, well, first of all, synchronize our receiver and transmit clocks. We can't just assume that they're perfectly synchronized, right? Uh, um, we, have to, we have to make sure that that's done then we need to calculate the velocity throughout that trip, throughout that path that that signal uh, travels. And then we need to know the position of each of the satellites, just like we knew the position of each of these towers and we were able to draw these, uh, uh, you know, calculate the radius and draw these circles right and then find that solution we need you know we could do that because we knew the position of these towers right so um we need to know where the position of each uh satellite when they sent the signal okay so because we do not measure the distance directly i'm using this uh, very loosely and generically, we're going to refer to these distances as, as pseudo ranges, right? So we're, we're dealing with time and even a lot of our time is quite ambiguous, uh, as we'll see. So how do we do this multilateration in GNSS? So we're going to measure the time as a proxy for distance from four plus satellites. This results in a, a pseudo range, or actually four plus pseudo ranges. The distance from each satellite maps out a sphere where the spheres intersect is the fix. Uh, three satellites, foreign spheres intersect at two points, but as I said, one point is high above the earth, so it can be disregarded in most applications. A fourth satellite is generally needed in order to provide that time synchronization. Okay, and even then, we're still going to have some errors, which we'll talk about. That's uh, going to mean that the um, the fix is not going to be perfect. It's not necessarily going to be a single point. All right. So uh, clocks. Well, the um, uh, GPS satellites carry on the order of two Rubidium and two cesium atomic clocks. Uh, again, different generations or blocks of these satellites include different numbers. In some cases, it's one Rubidium and two cesium, and then it's two Rubidium and one blah, 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 right? So we're all Rubidium. Uh, but they're all atomic clocks, and they use multiple ones of them so they can synchronize them and try to get the best of, of all of those. Um, uh, atomic clocks are an interesting topic. Um, and uh, um, but basically, real quickly, the atomic clocks give you excellent long-term stability. Looking at uh, atomic uh, transitions or transitions at uh, uh, the atomic level, where you're you're stimulating it with some external source, usually RF energy, microwave energy that causes the uh, atoms, uh, some sort of gas, to um, uh, move to a higher energy state. And then they, um, 
they will uh, spontaneously on an individual level transition back to a lower energy state, but they, uh, because of quantum, uh, uh, quantum mechanics, whatever, uh, quantum physics, uh, that uh, tends to follow a very uh, specific timing pattern. Um, and uh, they are um, typically noisy at a short-term level, so they're usually uh, uh, locked to a uh, oven-controlled, temperature-controlled crystal oscillator. Uh, so that'll give you the uh, good uh, short-term noise performance, minimizes your short-term noise, uh, but then the atomic clocks uh, manage your long-term noise. Right? So, um, these are in a process I touched on earlier, synchronized to a standard atomic clock or actually sets of them um, uh, at uh, NIST uh, in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, there's other atomic clocks around the world, and these are also uh, sometimes incorporated in determining uh, the true exact time as standards organizations define it right so um the now in comparison your clocks on the receivers are cheap small low power uh they're not very good and uh so uh for obvious reasons uh it's it's uh difficult to fit an atomic clock inside your phone uh, actually darpa's had a research program going on and miniaturize atomic clocks to do them kind of in a microelectronics uh, uh, standpoint. But um, yeah, uh, we're a long ways away from having atomic clocks in our pockets. Uh, so we have uh, cheap clocks. And so we're gonna have to accept the fact that a receiver clock is inaccurate and suffers from high drift. Uh, and again, that's the reason why we need, typically need this four satellite uh, because we have this extra degree of freedom, which is that uh, time offset between our transmit and our receive clock. Okay, so by the way, I use uh, sometimes use TX is a very common abbreviation for transmitter and RX for receiver. Okay. Um, all right, so now uh, we we talked about clocks, right? But we also need to know the velocity of the signal. The signal is carried on an electromagnetic wave, uh, like around one and a half gigahertz. And so it, it travels at roughly the speed of light, we'll call that lowercase c, in free space. But we're not really operating in true free space. Uh, the ionosphere in particular has um, it impacts us, the velocity of the signal quite a bit due to charged particles. Um, uh, the ionis, uh, the troposphere, which is uh, much closer to the Earth, that's the one we live in basically, um, that also affects it, but not nearly as uh, as much. So it's the ionosphere that uh, has the, the biggest impact. There's a few other things that impact uh, the, uh, speed and and or distance and and some things and in fact in in the extreme uh, this is one of those situations uh, um, practical situations where uh, relativity both general and special uh, relativity uh, relativistic effects have to be accounted for because the satellites are moving so fast in their orbit with respect to uh, the receiver that uh, the uh, time you end up with, and I'm not a physicist by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, you do suffer some time dilation uh, effects. And so um, the uh, uh, clocks have to account for that. Fun facts to know. All right, uh, pseudo range observables. Uh, so let's start putting this down and terms of equations. We haven't done a lot of equations yet in this class, so uh, we'll, we'll start to make up for that in this course, uh, in this uh, rest of this lecture here. So we have P, which is the pseudo range, right? So that's what we're training, what we're measuring. Uh, but rho is the geometric true distance. That's, we, we'd like to work with rho, right? That's a true distance. But it's, uh, 
you know, occluded or hidden by these other effects, right? By this uh, difference between the two clocks, the transmit and receive clock, and the difference in um, the the time difference uh, in the the pass, right? So, um, and all those are going to affect our uh, true range, right? So. Um, and so let's uh, let's start forming this, and let's call T the receiver clock reading at reception. Okay, and T uh, marked with an S there as our satellite clock reading at transmission. Okay, and then C. Okay, that's speed of light and. P uh, to this S is our estimated distance, right? So uh, if we can figure out all these things exactly, we can we can get our answers, right? So um, T and, and T of the S are, uh, and that's not an exponent, it's just a marking, uh, are readings but include errors, right? So um here t now is our true time again and tau's are uh representing these errors so if we do start doing some substitution now we can take this t and substitute in this t plus tau so that's um that's due to the receiver and then this uh uh tau S is due to the uh, transmitter on a satellite, right? So then we uh, rearrange terms here a little bit, group our T's, group our tau's, and then uh, we'll say that this rho S T come, uh, as a function of T and T S is the true range from receiver at receive time to satellite at transmit time. And then these are the the buggers that are causing us problems and um, trying to trying to calculate these right so uh now we can put this in terms of cartesian coordinates uh so we'll we'll call the center of the earth uh the origin and uh the x-axis can go through uh, uh the equator along the prime meridian uh the y-axis can be aligned with uh um, uh, 90 degrees to that, and the z-axis uh, at the pole. I think that's our coordinate system. Um, but we're uh, we're we're developing a Cartesian coordinate system, and we're going to uh, uh, you know calculate things in terms of that. So, right. So now we can. Uh, this, these are just our um, you know orthogonal basis. Uh, functions unit functions uh and uh where you you know you would have uh as a vector form you would have uh u of x u of y u of z there uh but then to get the magnitude of that line of that the length of that line or the magnitude of that vector we square each of those and then take the uh the square root of the uh, sum of those right um but here we're looking at the differences and the exposition of the satellite at T of S and the uh, position of our receiver at time T, right? And uh, the Y uh, versions of those and the S versions of those. Now, this is T is the time at reception and T S is the time at transmission. But uh, I'm sorry, I... I uh, I missed that one uh, edit there that should not have been 0.7, but rather 0.07. And just to order a magnitude off, that's no big deal. So I changed it there, but I, I hadn't changed it there. So the transmission time is on the order of uh, 70 milliseconds, right? So 0.07 seconds. Satellite moves really far in that in that time frame i just did some real quick back of the envelope calculations looking at the orbital altitude and, and um 
you know, how fast it would be traveling. And, and I came up 272. I haven't verified that. I could be totally wrong. Uh, but, uh, but it's, it's moving uh, pretty far just in that tiny uh, time frame. We're trying to locate ourselves very accurately, right? So we need to correct for that. So really, uh, we need to know where it was, in other words, X, Y, Z, uh, S, at that time, T of S, right? Not when we receive it, but where it was when it started transmitting. So we can solve for this iteratively. Uh, we just start with a, a guess of uh, that these times are the same. We know they're not, but let's start there. And uh, so then we'll uh, say that uh, D of S at this iteration zero is equal to T, and that's this uh, big T minus tau. And, uh, but then let's iterate. So we'll correct for satellite position based upon the transmit time estimated from the previous iteration, right? So now we'll, we'll uh, estimate uh, this and, uh, uh, bias our, our T accordingly now so they're not exactly the same. And we'll just kind of keep iterating until we converge a little bit, okay? So that's just kind of how we can work our way back to uh, what um, these uh, this distance is in terms of that, uh, those times there. All right, so uh, now let's, let's, uh, consider multiple satellites okay so let's look at four satellites and so we're going to denote each of those with this little exponent that's not an exponent in parentheses right and so each of these satellites have an x y z position and uh so those are going to be different right and um then there's going to be um, the error due to this uh, uh, receiver cloth uh, uh, issues and an error uh, due to the um, uh, transmit clocks, right? So, um, uh, or error is a, a strong word for that, right? But, uh, but this is all part of uh, trying to calculate the true uh, distance uh, from the red distance accounting for these clock offsets, right? So we really want to solve for these x's, y's, z's, and uh, this tau here, right? So uh, we, um, uh, and this, these taus are really small. Um, so this is going to be a, a nonlinear um, set of equations. So we're going to linearize them using uh, a Taylor series approximation. Uh, so in general, we're going to linearize the equations using the constant and linear term of the Taylor series approximation. And um, I'm hoping that most of y'all have uh, studied a Taylor series approximation. Um, if not, um, maybe the next slide will uh, briefly uh, remind you or explain it, and you'll have to trust me on that. Um, but uh, so now, if we linearize it, then we can solve these four equations and four unknowns, right? So we have four satellites, one, two, three, four, four unknowns, X, Y, Z, and tau. And um, so that could technically uh, satisfy us, right? But the measurements are pretty noisy. So let's use a least squares approach and hopefully more than four satellites, right? So, um, you know, uh, the slide earlier said that, yeah, under optimal conditions, you might see nine satellites at a time. Uh, and so uh, we could uh, use all of those satellites and uh, a least squares approach will find the solution that minimizes 
the sum of the squares of the residuals or the, the differences that we're getting in all this, all these multiple data points, okay? Um, and at a really high level here, Taylor series expansion around a point A, okay, some uh, nonlinear function, uh, f of x uh, may have, should have uh, said approximately equal to. Um, evaluate that function at that point. That's kind of your constant term. And then um, take the uh, derivative of your function, okay? And then uh, at, at that point A, and um, then divide by one factorial, which conveniently is one. Um, and then, uh, uh, yeah, you multiply uh, that by the difference there, right? So that's kind of your constant term. That's a linear term in X, right? But it's a nonlinear function, right? So uh, if you want to get more accuracy, you include an additional term. Uh, and that would be your second derivative at the point A divided by your second uh, factorial of two. And then you square this difference term and then so on with your third derivative and fourth derivative and so on, right? So that uh, converges generally. And, um, uh, but normally we're looking at these first two terms, again, the constant and the linear term particularly if we're gonna use least squares uh, approximation and uh, solve this as uh, uh, using matrices in a series of uh, uh, multiple uh, linear equations. So um, now this is all in terms of X. Well, we've got X, Y, Z, and T, right? So uh, really we're going to um, uh, now replace these differentials with partial derivatives, right? So now uh, we still have that kind of constant term here of that function at that uh, A, location A. Here we'll call it x0, y0, z0, tau0, but that's equivalent to this point A that we're evaluating at, right? Taylor series is always about a particular point, right? And within a very narrow region of that point, you can kind of pretend or approximate your nonlinear function as a linear uh, or, or as a um, uh, series of uh, terms with derivatives. And uh, by restricting yourself to the first two terms, you basically linearizing that, uh, that function about that point. Right, and so here we take partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, z, and tau, uh, respectively. So now let's uh, kind of plug in and, and rearrange terms, and now we have this um, uh, p of x, y, z, tau uh, minus this uh, uh, p of uh, around that specific point there. Uh, that's our location, and um, uh then now we've got the delta y deltas uh delta x y z and and tau right so um wow a lot going on here right so we now we have a, a p observed minus the p computed and now we're going to take this uh partial differential of this p complex uh nonlinear p function uh times this delta x delta y delta c delta tau right so uh again let's look at this as four or more different uh, uh satellites right so each of these is an independent equation right we make a measurement from uh one satellite make another measurement from another satellite, another measurement from the third satellite, fourth satellite, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth. And uh, we simply arrange all these uh, independent equations in a matrix form uh, because then we can use the power matrices to uh, uh, 
calculate our, our solutions. So I've added these noise terms, these Vs, right? These are uh, going to be different independent for each satellite, um, but hopefully they're gonna be small. Our goal is to find uh, this while minimizing uh, the effect of the noise. Okay, so we're gonna call this A, this matrix here A, this matrix here B, okay, and uh, then this is what we're looking for, and this is what we're trying to kind of wash out or average out of the system, right? So, uh, so since we have noise, we will not get a perfect answer with just these four equations. So we're gonna add more rows for more observed satellites. Now we have an overdetermined system. We have more equations than variables that we're solving for. So uh, using least squares, we'll use all the information to minimize the square of those residuals. And uh, I'm using now hats a little carrots over these terms to represent the um, uh, the estimated values that we're trying to find, right? And um, then um, this is, I'm just going to put it down here without a lot of uh, explanation. Maybe you want to actually implement this as a project a uh, semester project that might be fun uh, to do. I, I used uh, least squares in my master's thesis uh, uh, was a, a big part of that. So it's just a fun little algorithm to implement. Um, but you're gonna take the transpose of A, multiply it by A, and then take the inverse of that and then multiply it by A, uh, the transpose of uh, A, and then times this B. Right, that we that we measure again. Reminder: these are your A's, these are your B's. Right. So um, now that inverse must exist. And if you've ever done any, uh, 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 you know, inverse uh, inverting matrices, you know, it can uh, be fraught with uh, issues, um, and uh, you may not get the answer at all. Uh, it, or you may uh, you may find you run into some um, numerical issues and you don't get an accurate answer, right? So, uh, and there are some uh, uh, interesting, elegant ways of actually performing this operation rather than just brute forcing it like this. Uh, but in the end of the day, the inverse must exist, right? If we're going to get a solution and uh, should be well conditioned, all right? So what do we mean by that? Well, um, on a practical standpoint, um, the satellite should be spread out so they give you diverse information, right? So if you remember back to my example of you're on some boat and you're making these bearing line sightings to a lighthouse and a tower and a buoy, and if they're all on the starboard side, then your lines are all going to be parallel and, and exactly where they're cross is going to be really sensitive to errors and it's uh, going to be uh, really hard to figure that out, right? So, um, you know, I said it's, it's best to kind of choose landmarks that are orthogonal to each other, 90 degrees apart and, and get a, a nice diversity of uh, landmarks to site. The same thing is applying here with the satellites, right? And uh, the the constellation is laid out to handle this so that um, I realize it's gotten quite dark as I've been talking and I should turn on the, turn on the light. Um, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm back. Um, so uh, the satellites are spread out in orbit, so at any given instance, uh, the, the satellites are kind of spread out throughout the sky. You might see four, you might see up to nine, uh, but they're all in different parts of the sky. And so um, 
that will tend to give us this good inversion uh, ability to invert this uh, and get good results out of it. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong screen. Uh, to be able to invert this uh, this matrix here, this transpose times the uh, original matrix and then inverting that. All right, so, um, well, we made some assumptions there that uh, uh, we knew where the satellite was when the signal was transmitted, right? And we just kind of covered at a very, very high level of how to iteratively figure out what the time was uh, uh, when the the signal was uh, transmitted and kind of correcting for that. Um, but uh, but we still need to know where in the sky, uh, in space, it is, and uh, that is we 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 receive that information in a form of ephemeris or ephemerides, um, and this is uh, a term that describes uh, the the orbital parameters basically. Um, encoded this is encoded in a message that's transmitted by each satellite in its signal that it's that it's sending so it sends out a signal we use that signal to try to get the the timing to figure out how uh how far away the satellite is but it also gets modulated with data and uh, a big part of that data is a, a very um uh, is is this ephemeris for that particular satellite? Each satellite sends its own, and that's going to uh, include information for the receiver to be able to calculate that precise location of that satellite uh, at the time it transmitted the signal. Okay, that's essential information. That is only valid for about four hours. Satellites, you know. Yeah, once you put a satellite into orbit, it's generally going to stay in that orbit, but that's only if uh, what it's orbiting has a uh, ideal center of mass, um, which I kind of hinted that the Earth is not that way, right? It's an oblate sphere, spheroid with uh, non-homogeneous uh, densities in the Earth and uh, that sort of thing, right? So. Um, and, oh, we got this moon out there and we've got other things. All of those uh, end up with a end uh, body or multi-body um, uh, problem that kind of tugs on those uh, satellites and causes them to maybe not fly in their perfect orbit, right? So uh, we need to update those uh, on a regular basis. And uh there's also an almanac uh that uh uh gives us a course orbital and status information for each or all of the satellites in the constellation so basically each satellite transmits an almanac um but it's it's much coarser information but allows the receiver to lock on to one satellite start downloading data and in that way figure out where all the other satellites are roughly right then it can lock onto those easier right so um this almanac includes course orbital and status information from each of the satellites um it also relates the gps time to uh universal coordinated uh, coordinated universal time uh, UTC, that's what we consider the, the perfect time, right? Uh, standard time. Um, another fun fact to know is that uh, UTC is occasionally updated by adding a leap second. You hear about that on the news every now and then. Uh, for some reason, it's interesting. Uh, and that, oh, we're, we, we found that uh, uh, we need to add a leap second to really uh keep time perfectly accurate right on an astronomical basis and uh but we don't do that with gps right so uh because the receivers would have to know that and that was a decision made a long time ago so uh the gps time is continually uh it's it's synced to utc 
but there's uh, but there's a drift to it in the form of these leap seconds that are added to UTC. So GPS time never changes, uh, never gets a leap second added to it. So, uh, but we send that in, that offset, the current offset in these almanacs, and it also sends a kind of a rough uh, ionospheric model, right? So the ionosphere, uh, as I said, it's um, it's very high. It's one of the outer layers uh, of our atmosphere, and it's it's a stretch to even call it an atmosphere at that point, right? And um, but it is high enough that the sun's solar radiation causes uh, particles uh, to or electrons to kind of uh, free themselves from. Uh, their atoms and uh, to to a certain degree, right? So looser bound uh, electrons. So you end up with a bunch of charged particles in the ionosphere. And that actually has been used since the dawn of radio to uh, bend uh, or reflect high frequency waves. Um, uh, and you can bounce from one continent to another by bouncing it off the ionosphere. Um, but in the case of GPS, it has an effect of the phase velocity of the electromagnetic magnetic wave as it's uh, traveling through it. So um, that turns out to be pretty one of the more significant error uh, uh, errors in all of these calculations. Uh, and so we roughly correct uh, this TS. Um, based upon uh, this data uh, and the almanac, you know, it's not as precise uh, as the ephemeris, ephemerides information. Uh, so it's it's valid for more than uh, about two weeks or so. And uh, of course the uh, uh, Department of Defense is updating these, uh, uh, you know, on a, uh, regular basis to account for uh, their time of validity. All right, so um, so I've been saying that we measure time uh, from these signals without actually talking about exactly how that's done, right? So um, in, it's kind of similar uh, to some degree in a simple pulsed radar, but it's not. Right. So uh, if you're familiar with radar, you uh, send out a pulse uh, in a particular direction. And if it bounces off something, it comes back to your antenna and you receive it. You measure the time it took for that round trip distance and you uh, multiply that by the, the speed of light and you get a round trip distance. Divide that by two. And you get uh, you get the distance to the target. If you know which direction your antenna was pointing, you get a pretty good idea of the bearing, right? So that's radar. Um, more sophisticated radars use a more sophisticated waveform than just a simple pulse, right? In the case of GPS, we're doing something similar. Um, we're sending out a waveform that is a series of pulses that is actually quite long and continuous, in fact. But we can um, lock onto it and we can use the structure of those pulses to collapse all of them into a single peak, right? So um, now if you've had, uh, a course in communication, modern communication systems. Uh, for seniors, you'll likely take that next semester uh, in uh, EECE 449. Uh, if you're a grad student, hopefully you had uh, some exposure to that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, we're in 449. You'll take it in 474 um, uh, next semester, right? And uh, so we talk about spread spectrum there. And what, uh, um, again, we're, we don't have time to, to really dive into this, so you'll have to trust me until next semester uh, uh, or or uh, do some 
do some studying about this, but basically a uh, we take a signal and we spread it out in uh, time and uh, frequency. We take that signal and we, we basically chop it with a fast, uh, faster changing code. Okay, so if we have uh, some data that, uh, let's say, is just arbitrarily one second long, okay, is a, a bit of data, and then we'll we follow that with another second of another data and another second of another data, and that might be a zero or one, and that might map to a plus one or minus one uh, volt or, or something like that, right? Now, uh, when we spread it, we're going to take a, a much faster code, let's say one that changes every one millisecond, okay? So a thousand times. I'm just pulling some numbers out here, right? So uh, the data is coming at you at one second uh, pulses. But now we're going to uh, exclusive or that data with these thousand different uh, codes, uh, we call them chips, and uh, they're in a pseudo-random sequence, okay? In other words, it looks random, but it's very repeatable, right? And um, we can generate a number of unique pseudo-random codes. So each satellite is assigned a unique code to modulate the signal, okay? And uh, so that chipping sequence or the pseudo-random code might be uh, plus or minus ones, right? And you're exclusive ORing these with, uh, or maybe we can keep it in terms of logical bits since I'm, I'm using a logical term here, exclusive OR. But you're going to um, uh, exclusive OR that with your signal. So now instead of getting one pulse out, you're going to get a thousand pulses out. But let's say that if uh, the bit input data bit uh, is one, then uh, you'll end up just copying those pseudo random codes, right? But if the bit is zero, then we'll ultimately map that to the neg negative of those uh, pseudo random codes. Uh, so it just, just be flipping it. Right. So, um, that's super high level, but I hope that that gets you enough to kind of follow what happens here. So when, uh, at the receiver, if you correlate that original signal that's been chipped or, or chopped with the pseudo random code, if you then correlate it with the same code, so correlation is kind of like convolution, but you don't flip it in time. Um, but um, if you use that same code, then uh, now you will collapse all of those thousand chips spread out over time into a very narrow spike, like one thousandths of the length of of time in the time domain, right? So now you get uh, a narrow spike that you can measure fairly precisely uh, in the time domain. Now, the cool thing is, is that since each satellite has a different code and those codes are designed to be somewhat orthogonal or you know, ideally completely orthogonal, then um, when a receiver uh, multiplies uh, a different satellite with that same code, it will not correlate to this narrow spike. It will remain all kind of spread out and, uh, uh, and uh, at a much lower amplitude. So uh, you can, in a receiver, you, these codes are known to both the transmitter and the receiver. So you replicate that set of codes in the receiver. You try each code with the signal. And uh, as it turns out that, 
they're uh, they're all transmitted at the uh, same frequency. Let's say on L1 at one uh, fifteen seventy five point four two megahertz, and um, then uh, we're chipping it with a uh, thousand twenty four chips at one point oh two three megachips per second. Okay, now uh, then because these are what we call gold codes and they're unique to each satellite, we can transmit all of the signals at the same time. But then we can correlate that one waveform that we, we receive at the receiver. It's all at the same frequency, all at the same time. But we can extract each satellite signal individually by correlating it with its unique code. So we can, uh, for satellite one, we'll use satellite one's unique code and we'll get satellite one's signal and this correlation peak. And it will be minimally affected by satellites two, three, four, five, whatever, right? Then we repeat the process with satellite two and we correlate that same signal with uh, satellite two's code. And now satellite one will will be washed out, but satellite two will have a strong correlation peak and all the other satellites will be same washed out, right? And we keep repeating that. Well, in modern receivers, we do all that in parallel, right? We've got these uh, correlators implemented in, in logic and we can uh, correlate like 12, uh, 12 different satellites at the same time uh, as a typical number. So, um, but that's the idea is that all of the uh, signals, um, L1 is your main frequency, right? Uh, and this course acquisition code or abbreviated C slash A is then transmitted on L1 with this uh, chipping parameter and it's binary phase shift keying, right? So basically this is, Again, if you haven't had communication systems yet, this might be a new concept for you, but uh, we might map a uh, logic bit one to um, a uh, RF signal with nominally one volt at zero degree phase. But then if we uh, have a, a different bit, uh, what did I say before, a bit of one, now if we have a bit of zero, we might map that to minus 180 degrees, okay, we'll flip the phase, uh, or, or 180 degrees, it doesn't matter, 180 minus 180, right? Uh, well, if you think about it, that's just like multiplying by minus one, right? If you think about your um, um, uh, your complex plane or, or multiplying uh, uh, something by a, um, a, a phase, uh, a cosine, cos cosine signal, with a phase of 180 degrees relative to zero, then that's the same as multiplying by minus one. Um, so, um, you know, this would be modulated as, as kind of a plus or minus type of thing or zero and 180 degrees. So, um, all right, so that's kind of the, the legacy system that, that course acquisition code then pr uh, produces this correlation peak and we can get uh, a time associated with that. Uh, there's also a legacy uh, signal for the military. It's the called the P code. This is uh, um, much uh, longer. Actually, I think I this might be the the period of each chip, or maybe that minus should be plus. I don't know. It's a very very long code. Uh, I'll double check that with my notes. And um, so it's much, much longer than the length of the course acquisition code for the, that anyone can use, the civilians can use, right? So this is unique to the military. And uh, it repeats itself uh, every about 266 days, right? So uh, a very long code. Um, I'm not including all the information in here. I'm just trying to give you an exposure to all this. 
uh, it's also chipped at a much faster rate uh, than uh, this 1.0. It's it's chipped at 10 times that rate. And uh, so, uh, but instead of having uh, 24 different P codes, we take this really long code and we chop it up so that each satellite has uh, a different segment of this long code, right? So uh, in the CA code, each one gets its own unique uh, code, unique to the satellite. In this case, we have one code, but we just use different segments of it. And, and one satellite will be assigned to a certain segment and it'll repeat it in seven days, right? So it's modulated onto the carrier at 10 times the rate the CA code is and in quadrature to it. What, is, what does that mean? Well, uh, I do kind of mention here that it's uh, BPSK, but it's kind of quadrature AM modulated, but not exactly. Um, so, here, what we do is, uh, if you have a BPSK signal, you can modulate it with uh, a, a cosine omega t plus zero, or a cosine omega t plus uh, 180 degrees, right? And uh, that's how you can map your bits onto this signal waveform. Um, well, you could also say, uh, I'll modulate this with the cosine omega t plus 90 or cosine omega t minus 90. So that would be orthogonal if you look at the complex plane, uh, the real and imaginary axis, and uh, rotate that phaser around 90 degrees. Now you're, you're kind of on the imaginary axis instead of the real axis. We call that uh, quadrature. And so it turns out that it's pretty easy uh, electronics-wise to extract those signals. We can easily extract the real signals and easily ex uh, extract the imaginary signals. So we can modulate them onto the same RF microwave carrier signal, we call it. And, um, uh, but but they're, uh, they're still separate, but they're using the same signal to transmit, and we can either focus in on the the real axis, or we can focus in on the imaginary axis. So, um, all right. So then, that's that military P code. Well, it turns out that that uh, could still be spoofed, right? Someone could uh, still take this and just uh, uh, take some bogus data and and. Uh, chip it with that sequence and you know they could observe uh, observe enough data and extract out this uh, sequence here um, but uh, to prevent that spoofing we take that P code now and we XOR it with this W code uh, to produce the Y code and we call that P of Y right so but it's uh, the P code XOR with the W code and uh, that produces this Y code that's actually transmitted. So uh, turns out that the, you know, of course the W code is, is highly classified. There's uh, not much information out there. You can go and find some people's, you know, they've analyzed this, they've tried to, uh, to uh, you know, try to figure out some characteristics of it. So there's information out there in the public domain, but uh, in general, it's classified. We can't get to all the information about it. Uh, this is a very cryptographic code, in other words. So, um, all right. So those are our legacy codes, and those have been around since the beginning of GPS, and they will do a good job. Uh, and uh, the uh, this code here was originally designed for anyone's use and it would be good enough. Well, we can actually do a whole lot better um, by instead of just looking at this correlation peak, we can look at actually some of the phases of these chips and, and stuff. Um, this 
uh, P code was originally thought to need this course acquisition code to uh, bootstrap it to be able to receive this P code or PY code. But yeah, things have evolved. So now we have these modern signals. Now these are um, at various stages of rollout uh, because generally these satellites are not fully software defined. And so um, you can't just upload some new code to them. They need new hardware, right? So, uh, and some of these codes are transmitted at different powers on different frequencies. So you need new new hardware. So basically we can create a new signal, uh, but it doesn't get rolled out until there's sufficient number of satellites that have been built, launched, uh, brought up to uh, to speed, so to speak, and, uh, and uh, turned on live. Uh, one of the 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 details in this um, uh, data that gets transmitted is whether the uh, satellite is uh, to be trusted or not, whether it's in uh, um, uh, some mode where it, it uh, is not fully online yet or that type of thing, right? So uh, these different signals are at different uh, stages of evolution. So M is an enhanced uh, anti-jamming and anti-spoofing for the military. It's also obviously classified. The L2C is a civilian code that's transmitted on L2, right? So let's go back here. L1 is our basic frequency, 1.575 gigahertz. And uh, L2 is a little bit lower, uh, 300 megahertz or so, uh, 350 megahertz lower in frequency, 1.1. Uh, 1227.6 megahertz, right? So these are L band, uh, which is uh, where I assume that uh, L comes from. Uh, L is uh, uh, L band is is goes back to World War II with the uh, different designations of uh, microwave bands, um, and so L band's just in the one and a half gigahertz range. Uh, L two uh, so L two C is on this other frequency. Now, having two frequencies allows us uh, to, to correct for those ionospheric effects, right? So um, as it turns out, the ionosphere is dispersive, meaning that the velocity that the wave travels through it is a function of its frequency. So if... Um, uh, you, you know, free space is non-dispersive. Every wave, no matter what frequency, all travels at the same same velocity, right? But in uh, certain media, uh, they're dispersive and the ionosphere is dispersive. And by transmitting it at two different frequencies, we can build up a model of what that delay is for each of the, uh, of the signals. And, uh, and therefore correct for it um, uh, locally, right? So uh, I mentioned um, earlier that the Almanac uh, sends out this kind of course model of the ionosphere over the earth or over regions of interest. And, uh, but that's still just a model and it still only has a certain resolution, uh, spatial resolution. Whereas if you can measure your signals directly, now now you know, right? So it might change uh, after a bit, but if you can uh, do these two, at least you have two data points in which uh, you can uh, compensate things. So that was a big enhancement. Uh, the L5 is uh, another um, uh, civilian code. This is really for critical applications such as airplane landing approaches. This is at a different uh, frequency and it's turns out it's in an internationally protected band so no matter where you are in the world that uh, that frequency is only used for this type of purpose it's also wider bandwidth and higher power so you can receive it uh, better uh, basically it's more reliable can carry more information um, the l1c signals are newest signal it's not fully online yet uh, to my knowledge uh, it's, uh, um, again, a civilian uh, code. Uh, I've got some jargon in here 
uh, with a Daedalus pilot carrier that, you know, we haven't gone into enough depth in my super quick explanation of the signals here to, to, to make sense of that. But uh, basically, it allows you to uh, track things instead of on a um, uh, this correlation peak, which is still kind of a function of how fast that chipping is done. Um, uh, now we can look at the uh, carrier and measure the phase of it. And um, uh, there's some ambiguity in doing that. So uh, we have to work at it to remove that ambiguity. And uh, but uh, by measuring the phase, we can get much more resolution out of uh, our time. Um, don't worry if you didn't follow all that. I understand that was kind of some hand waving there, uh, trying to trying to explain it in a way that uh, if you haven't had communication systems, it might make sense. But basically, it's going to improve tracking. So, and it also allows a little bit better interoperability with Galileo on its L1 uh, carrier. Also, Galileo again is the uh, uh, European Union version of all of this. All right, uh, closing it out. I think we'll stop there. Uh, so that's a good place uh, to stop. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, signal data, and then we'll look at sources of errors. Uh, and then how we can enhance uh, things and uh, some some kind of issues, challenges that we have with GPS. Then uh, we'll uh, talk about odometry. Um, and I might, oops, I might update, uh, uh, I might add some slides to this uh, uh, before next week, but we won't go into odometry as uh uh, nearly as as deep. I think we can uh, maybe understand that pretty quickly uh, and stuff. So there is an assignment up on uh, Moodle. Um, it's uh, maybe kind of a I don't know a fun assignment maybe, uh, but uh, it's from GPS.gov. And it's uh, ask you to um, here. I'll just stop sharing. Um, not gonna find that. So it's um, <clears throat> it's gonna have you download a map, and it's gonna have some data, and you're gonna take some string, and you're gonna measure things out. You're basically gonna do kind of a, a by hand mechanical multilateralization or trilater trilateral trilateration. Uh, exercise. So, um, you know, do it. You'll get your points for it. Uh, just kind of have fun with it. If it's uh, not your thing or too much of a hassle, I can easily give you some more, uh, some other uh, GPS related assignment. But uh, I thought that just might be a little fun. Uh, might take you back to kindergarten and, and working with uh, string and, and scissors and and that type of thing. So um, anyway, we'll see how it works. Uh, but the main thing uh, is focus on your project and uh, getting your research reports. Just, uh, just getting these things off the ground is the main thing. I know a number of you have spoken to me about it, uh, and, and we've had some good talks. I uh, posted a lot of ideas on the questions forum. Feel free to toss your own ideas in there and you know, we can kind of crowdsource some things. If you're undergraduate, I think we can talk about you working with a partner. If you're a graduate, you can work with a partner, but I, you know, really like you working on distinct uh, things, but it may make sense to, to mash up uh, two different aspects of a project into one. Uh, so, you know, these things are for you. Uh, figure out what you want to learn, and um, then I'll... Um, I'll help you through that. So, uh, all right, have a great week, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Take care. Thank you, Justin.